I've been an IT guy for over 10 years now. And yeah, I know what you're thinking. IT, ha. Browsing Reddit, installing Google Ultron. Like anything supernatural happens in an easy job like that. To be honest, you're mostly right. It's not all browsing, but it's a job I'm capable of and find relatively easy. But it's not the role that's given me sleepless nights. The backup site three months ago, my company decided to get with the 2000s and get a lease on an office to use as a disaster recovery site. For those who don't know, if the main office burns down, floods, or gets sucked into a black hole, some or all of the staff head to the DR site and carry on working. As is usual for most companies, it was a mess to begin with. Our directors went out first to do the high level will this meet our needs check over. The company signed a three year lease and then us techs got to go over, find it wasn't suitable and still make it all work. My first impression of the office wasn't great, but not ordinary. A floor in what used to be a factory making plastic mannequins in the middle of an industrial estate. The old business folded years ago. The building was sold and bought by an enterprising sort who caught the bandwagon of renting spaces to businesses. Unfortunately, the new owners didn't do much in the way of conversion. A few partition walls here, a suspended ceiling there, a few doors bolted and padlocked to separate the different clients' spaces. In all honesty, it was a cheap dump, but it wasn't being a dump that made me uneasy from the first second I walked in. No, the first thing I noticed was the smell about the place. Not just the smell of musty, damp air that came from a leaking roof and no maintenance, but something plasticky. Like if you take a bag and burn it with a lighter. The next thing I thought was off was the hallway that separated the toilets from the main office. In itself, there wasn't anything weird about it. Open a door from the main office and there were three other doors. The one to the left was a fire exit locked by one of those little ceramic bolts, which led to a fire escape. The door was mostly glass and beyond it were some large windows to see outside. Directly in front of the office door were the toilet doors. To the right, the hallway stretched off for 20 or 30 feet before dog-legging off to the left again. But the hallway was dark, like always dark. The first time I had to use the bathroom was late on a Tuesday afternoon when I was working there every other day doing installations. Feeling the call of nature, I headed out of the main office and was immediately struck by how gloomy the hallway was. I mean, this was straight out of a creepypasta gloom. Looking up, I saw a few of the tubes were out, and only one directly above the doors was working. Being the non-superstitious guy I am, I flicked my phone torch on and took a quick walk down the corridor. Around the corner was a dead end. And aside from a couple of boxes containing mannequin bits, it was totally unremarkable. Making a mental note to mention the lights to someone, I went off to do my business and returned to the main office. I was back there on Thursday with my buddy Jake to do some more installs. It was a bright sunny day outside, so it struck me as odd that the corridor was just as dark as before when I went to the toilet. The damp, plasticky smell was a little stronger today and assaulted my nostrils as soon as I opened the hallway door. Pulling out my phone and flicking the torch on again, I took a look around the corner to see if I could find the source. Lost in my thoughts, I nearly jumped out of my skin when the light flicked across something trying to crawl out of a box. My heart skipped for a second, but then I realized it was just a mannequin. One of those guys who was in yesterday must have thought it would be a good joke to position it as if it was crawling out, arm outstretched, 
head looking up, body half out of the box. Funny bastards. I retreated to the bathroom and did my thing, returning to the main office after and plotting petty revenge on Jake when I saw his smirk. A few hours later, Jake headed off for the day while I stayed to finish off some Windows installs. Feeling the need to pee again, I headed back toward the bathroom, flicking on more lights as it was getting dark again, chuckling to myself at the thought of the escaping mannequin. I wasn't really paying attention when I opened the door. I should have been, because I actually did jump out of my skin this time. The mannequin was out of its box and stood in the long stretch of hallway, its featureless face staring at the fire exit. Mother fuck, Jake! I shouted in surprise, taking a moment for my heart to actually start beating again. I cursed myself for letting Jake get me twice. I picked up the mannequin and carried it back around the corner. Walking back, I headed in and went to the urinal. Mid doing my thing, the smell of plastic came back. Washing my hands, I figured it was just the ventilation playing up again. The smell got even stronger as I headed toward the exit, and I pulled out my phone to start emailing my boss to inform the landlords. I'd never fully understood the description of ice-cold fear before I opened that door, but when I did, I got it straight away. Every hair on my neck stood on end when I looked up, the light of my phone illuminating the form of the mannequin. Instead of being around the corner, it was no more than two feet from the door, arm outstretched as its molded hand reached for the handle. My heart throbbed in my chest as I stood, frozen to the spot in horror. I looked at its blank, featureless face and it looked back at me. I stared at it for what felt like an eternity, until slowly, its head tilted, fucking tilted. Something snapped inside me, adrenaline or something else, and I screamed. I barreled past it, pounding across the hallway and through the main office towards the exit. I left everything behind as I ran for my car. Fortunately, this wasn't a bad horror movie. Thanks to keyless entry, I was straight away. And at the push of a button, the car started the first time. I locked the doors as I roared off. Before dialing my boss, I cast one last look at the office. There was a silhouette in the window. I work in a clothes shop, just your average fashion retailer. I'm a customer service shop advisor. My role is primarily to help people find the clothes they want in the fabled back room. You retailers know it. Just a pile of crappy shelves and eight crappy mannequins. On my breaks, I would often sit in the back room, eating my sandwich and checking my Facebook or whatever on my Blackberry all while waiting for my friends to text me back. They never did. I was incredibly bored and lonely in my job, so I used to just piss around on my breaks. One of my favorite things to do was to arrange the mannequins in funny positions, sexual or just comical fight scenes or the like. I noticed, however, that someone else must have been moving the mannequins as well. There was always one mannequin with a badly cracked skull that seemed to always face the spot where I sat whenever I came back in. It was so unnerving at first, but I found it quite funny, one of my friends probably moving it about to fuck with me. One day when I was at home, I was just browsing Reddit on my computer when my mom asks me to come downstairs. She wanted me to chop up the vegetables for soup. I'm good at it, but have you ever cut a butternut squash? That stuff is hard. I was peeling into it when the knife slipped and literally skinned a 5 by 8 centimeter shed of skin off my arm. I screamed bloody murder. I had peeled my arm like a vegetable, 
and there was a big slice of skin just on the floor. My mom ran in, and to her credit, slapped a towel on my arm. I was bleeding profusely, and in my embarrassed state, I felt pretty sick. I sat down as I was getting dizzy, and my mom picked up my skin and threw it in the bin. I had to take a few days off work, and went back in when I was able to move my arm again. I smirked when I saw my mannequins still in their orgy pose. I was proud of that one. No mannequin was lonely. Apart from the one with the cracked skull which was facing my break spot. I thought to myself, the boss must be in on the game as well. So I made a mental note to switch his decaf to an espresso whilst picking some painkillers for a migraine I was developing. My workday was pretty normal. It was coming up to 3 p.m., which was my 20-minute break. I then started my daily ritual of arranging my mannequins in a different pose. I went to move the cracked mannequin when I noticed something on its arm. It was all shriveled, and I realized the mannequin had the skin of my arm on it. I recoiled. How the hell did that get there? I'm not ashamed to admit that I puked in my mouth a little. I looked over the skin again. This was getting weird. I ran to my boss and explained in a rant what happened. Of course he didn't believe me, but I told him to check the mannequins so he obliged. He came back to the office and told me none of them had any skin on them. I was freaking out and he showed me the item list for the back room. Ten shelves, four bottles of Windoline, one mop, one Henry Hoover, nine lockers, seven mannequins. Seven? What happened to the eighth? He laughed at me. When I was younger, I was very skeptical of the world around me. Items seemed to move and shift in the corner of my eye, only to just be in the same place when I eventually looked back. I never thought anything of it, never told anyone what I thought I saw. As a kid, I knew I would just be looked down on, like I was crazy, like just a little kid who wanted attention. However, there were some events some things that transpired, that were burned into my mind, that seared images so deep they have affected who I have become. This is my recollection of the earliest event I can recall that made me aware of the world around me. My mother and father divorced when I was young. He was an alcoholic and ruined our lives for as long as I could remember. After they divorced, my mother focused on her work, delved into it, and rose higher at her job. In her higher position, she started to work with other companies. This is how she met DJ. DJ was a nice guy, a single father with a son named Jacob. About my age, maybe a year younger or a year older, I can't completely remember. They began dating and hit it off really quick. I could tell my mom was happy again, so I did my best to get along with Jacob. And it wasn't that he was a bad kid, he was just very loud and self-centered. About three weeks into them dating, DJ invited my mother and I to join him and Jacob out at their beach house for the weekend. My mom loved the idea, so we packed up our swimsuits and some extra clothes and got on the road that weekend. I don't know if it was because I was young, but the house looked occupied. It had a darker feeling to it and I think when I was younger, I ignored that feeling and just assumed that it was empty most of the year. DJ explained to us as we were unloading the car that this house had belonged to his great-grandfather who used it as a workshop for his tailoring. As we looked around the house, we headed upstairs, and I remember that the top stair creaked loudly as I stepped onto it. As we looked into the rooms, we found one of the rooms was used for clothes, storage, and nothing else. 
We headed up to the attic to see if there were any beach towels or toys we could use on the beach. I remember vividly running from the attic the first time I climbed the ladder into it. Six mannequins, some half bodies, some full in the far corner of the attic. It wasn't that they looked overly creepy or that I was afraid of styrofoam, but the way they were placed in the attic, how they didn't seem as dusty as everything else. They seemed out of place, as if they had been the one thing in this house that had still been used every day. I didn't go back into the attic that day. I waited downstairs until my mom brought down what she wanted to take to the beach. We didn't get to spend a lot of time down at the beach though. It was already late when we had gotten to the house and DJ and my mother were both tired from the drive over. They wouldn't let Jacob and I stay down at the beach by ourselves, so they herded us back to the house. We were given some blankets and placed on the couch in the downstairs living room. The extra room in the house was being used for storage, so we didn't have a bed we could use. My mother was very stern about us not watching television after 10 p.m., and DJ agreed with her. They gave us the remote and headed upstairs. Jacob quickly snatched the remote from me and started changing the channels until he found some cartoons. We stayed up for a while. My eyes kept drifting to the clock as it got closer to 10. I didn't want to get in trouble with my mom, but Jacob didn't seem to care. As the clock continued to inch forward, I kept trying to convince him that we needed to turn the TV off and go to bed. It was nearly 10.30 when I heard the first thud. Jacob and I looked at each other, and he quickly dove underneath his blanket, turning the TV's volume all the way down. There were no more sounds immediately after that. We peeked our heads out from the covers a few minutes later and deemed it safe to turn the TV back up a little bit. As Jacob reached for the remote, I heard the creak of the staircase and we quickly pulled the covers back over our heads. The creak from the top step happened five more times after that. That alone left me wondering if my mom was messing with us, trying to scare us into turning off the TV so she didn't have to come down and yell at us for not listening to her. As I hid under the covers, I listened for anything else that might give away the situation I was in. That might explain just what our parents were doing. I heard the fridge open and the sink turn on. Maybe DJ was a sleepwalker. I had heard of sleepwalkers doing really weird things when they were asleep. Maybe that could explain this. Regardless of what it was, it had piqued my curiosity. I lifted my blanket just a bit to see what was going on. It was then that I saw the six mannequins standing in different positions in the kitchen. One at the fridge, one by the sink, and one that made me hide again, right next to the dining room table. I looked to the far end of the covers by Jacob, who was visibly shaking. He clearly had gotten interested as well and had to take a look. I clenched onto the blanket as tightly as I could and shut my eyes, hoping this was just a horrible nightmare. My mom had warned me that staying up past my bedtime would give me nightmares. That was the only explanation. With my eyes closed tightly, I tried to sleep, but I almost panicked and ran for it, it being as far away from the house as possible. I don't know when I fell asleep or how I ended up on the floor either. Maybe it had been just a horrible nightmare and I tossed and turned all night. I looked over at Jacob who was awake, but he looked different. He wasn't being the loud kid that I knew he was, which could easily have just meant that he was still sleepy and hadn't fully woken up yet. It took some prying, but I convinced him to follow me upstairs. I had to see something for myself. We walked up to the entry to the attic and grabbed a chair so we could grab the drawstring. 
After we pulled the ladder down, I tried to get Jacob to go up the ladder, but he wouldn't. I took a few deep breaths and climbed the ladder. As I reached the top, I peeked over the floor at the corner I had remembered seeing the mannequins in. It didn't take me long to rush down the ladder. They were closer. Alright, so this is less of a scary story, as it is unexplained and just eerie. My brother was in his early 20s and had a child with this girl that lived about 15 minutes out of town from where we lived. Due to visitation, my brother got to see him every other weekend. At this same time, I was 14 and had just gotten my learner's permit. This is in South Dakota, by the way which has a really young driving age. And this time, my mother and brother thought it would be alright to let me drive them to get my nephew. So that is what we did. Now note that this evening fell at the end of fall and just before winter. There was no snow on the ground, but the temperature was extremely low and the wind was extremely strong. I mean this was the type of weather that would take the breath from you because it's so cold. One would be crazy to stand out in it, even if they were dressed for it. Though there was an interstate that we could have used, my mother thought it would be best to drive on this old highway that runs parallel to the interstate. On our way back, just before we got to our hometown, we noticed something strange. There was this black car, fairly new for the time, and of decent make, Mercedes perhaps that was pulled off to the right side of the road. Its trunk was open and this odd figure was standing behind it. This would seem like a normal situation except the figure was just standing there, as if locked in this position. Nothing moved on its body except for this bright white hair covering its face and blowing violently in the strong winds. It was facing towards a field across the road from the car. This person, or whatever it was, looked so odd. It wasn't holding itself to block the cold and wind. Instead, it just stood there, like a mannequin with its hands held out in front of it and curled up like it were a dead body with rigor mortis or something. Shocked, confused, and really curious, my mother and brother told me to slow down so we can get a look and see if this thing needed help. So I slow down, and we conspicuously look at this thing, like a family looking at wild animals on a trail or something. And we notice that it's really short, skinny and frail, like an old woman. And its extremely white hair just seemed so peculiar. We tried to get a good look at its face, but the wind was blowing its hair and covering it like I mentioned and it didn't even acknowledge us. It just stood there completely still. Well anyways, we agreed that it was bizarre and decided to drive around and see if we could get another look. This time we happened to look at the field it was facing across the street. I don't know how we could have missed it, but what we saw were these two quite tall figures dressed in black trench coats a little way into the field standing about 20 yards away from each other. They too were just standing there, in this blistering cold. But the oddest part of it all was that one of them was flying a black kite. We couldn't make anything out of it. After driving by this scene a couple times, car pulled over, trunk open, strange elderly looking white haired thing standing by the trunk, and two tall trench coat donned people flying a black kite. All of this in some of the most unbearable weather that I can remember. And this is South Dakota, mind you. We decided it was just best to let it be and go home. We did have a baby with us, and he was getting fussy. I now wish we had gotten out, though, because I will never be able to figure out the mystery that was this situation. This was the oddest event of my life. Hey guys and ladies, thanks for watching. 
If you want me to tell your story or read a creepypasta, email me at the address in the description. I wanted to show you guys how smart my girl Ripley is. Ready to show them, Ripley? All right. What's two plus three? That's right. What's one minus three? That's right, negative two. How do you say river in Swahili? Well, I'm not sure, but that's probably right. Okay, now stand on one leg. Good job. Do a backflip. Okay, now twist your head all the way around, like in The Exorcist. Good girl. Be good to animals, even people. See ya! Yo, it's me, Mark. Barksmith. Hush. And literary. And litter. <coughs> and litter. And litter. What the fuck? And literally. What? I don't know what you want. Do you gotta go potty? You're full of shit. You don't gotta go potty. I better see a big turd dropping or some piss shooting out. <laughs>